um, what can sexual justice look like? Um, I'm your chair, Ooh, Dahlia Gabriel, and I'm an editor at Navarra Media. And the inspiration for this event really came from the fact, obviously it came from the Me Too movement, um, but we kind of saw that there was this huge wave of like testimonies of sexual violence in every sector, in every industry, in every area of society. Um, that for many of us who have experienced this kind of violence and, and harassment uh, is something that we've spoken amongst ourselves and learned to expect in all parts of life, but it's not really been part of the public sphere in the way that it is now. Um, so whilst this has been really inspiring to watch, we've kind of realized that there isn't really the second part, which is like, okay, now that we know about this and now that it's public, what do we do next? And it seems that that's where you know, the movement starts to split up a little bit. You know, there's that kind of quite carceral p approach, which sees prison as the answer. There's also, you know, ideas of restorative justice, but everyone's a bit unclear of what that means or there's divisions over what that could look like. So the aim of this event is really to try and begin that conversation um, to really push um, this forward beyond just um, confession and testimony. So, as promised, we have three incredible speakers. Um, to begin with, we have Eleanor Penny, who is a senior editor at Navarra Media. We also have Paris Lees, who is a writer, journalist, and campaigner. And we have Dr. Shola Mos Shogbemimu, who is a lawyer and founder of Women in Leadership Publication and is one of the organizers of the Women's March in London. So the way it's going to work is I'm going to, um, we're going to open with some five to ten opening remarks from each of our speakers, then we'll open up to the floor and have a more open discussion. So Eleanor, would you like to go first? No? Sure. You don't have an option actually, because I'm the chair and I get to decide. <laughs> Um, cool. Ah, can you hear me? Cool. Hi. Um, so, um, I want to talk about what happens in uh, hotel rooms. Um, so, I want to take you way, way, way back to the fated hours of 2011, uh, when the then head of the IMF, who uh, was Dominique Strauss-Kahn, was indicted by a grand jury, jury in the US for sexual assault and attempted rape of a maid at a Sofitel hotel in New York. After pleading uh, not guilty, his bail was set at one million, which was kind of like petty change for him. Uh, and uh, the woman in question was uh, Nafisatu uh, Dialu, who was a Muslim immigrant from Guinea. She was a divorced single mother to a teenage daughter. Um, she was allegedly um, pursued down the hallways of this luxury hotel that she cleaned for a pittance by a man who pretty much held the purse strings of global economic markets. So if you want a vision of these like monstrous mechanics of global sexual power, I don't think we need to look much further than this. Um, actually, all charges against uh, Strauss-Kahn were eventually uh, dropped. Uh, and you know we're told that uh, rape charges uh, ruin a man's career, but actually he's just made a comeback onto the political scene at the uh, at the behest of Emmanuel Macron, my uh, favourite uh, whipping boy for neoliberalism. So the important thing here is that Diallo is not alone. Uh, the hospitality industry is rife with sexual assault and uh, cultures of abuse and impunity. Um, it also happens to be staffed by uh, disproportionately uh, migrant women of color, often on low pay, on precarious work with uncertain uh, migration status, AKA uh, by the people who are least empowered to uh, challenge their bosses and their clients, etc. cetera, uh, whoever uh, might be uh, harassing or assaulting them. And I mention this because I find it so uh, interesting that the stories which sparked this recent inferno of reparations uh, took place by uh, the people who uh, frequent hotel rooms rather than the people who um, uh, clean them. I don't want to diminish the, uh, the trauma of starlets and the actresses who came forward. You know, sexual violence is uh, terrible always and in all circumstances and uh, having money doesn't necessarily cushion the immediate trauma of that um, but it is important and revealing that the um, the most effective blow in the battle of rape culture was dealt 
uh, by women who were relatively in more stable uh, social positions, um, who weren't gambling on uh, future incomes by coming forward. They weren't gambling on their ability to pay rent to feed their kids. And there's a clear reason for this, um, that your ability to challenge um, rape culture is massively inflected, not just by your gender, but by other factors of race, of class, migration status, economic power. Basically, it's not just about Hollywood, it's also about Yarlswood, right? <laughs> And so in the wake of Me Too, we talk about changing the conversation around consent and detoxifying our like deeply troubling attitudes to uh, sex, and that's absolutely true. But when we say um, rape and violence is about uh, power more than it is about sex, um, we really need to couple that with a response which doesn't just tackle our attitudes to sex, it tackles our <laughs> structures of power. It tries to rectify a power imbalance in which, uh, in which sexual abuse flourishes. And um, those, those conditions are conditions of uh, social, economic and political hierarchy which me make it almost impossible for uh, women to come forward. So when we talk only about attitudes, we make sexual violence not a structural problem, uh, but uh, a problem of like individual moral failing and that doesn't imply a, a structural solution. So that seems like immediately woefully inadequate. Um, to my eyes, it's something that can't be just solved by replacing people in power with um, like more morally upstanding people or even just you know people of a different gender, but by um, challenging those power hierarchies um, in and of themselves. Um, because by challenging it on an individual basis, we end up with solutions that just aren't scalable. They might make us feel some kind of catharsis immediately, but I think that catharsis is a pretty doomed um, dead end because we know from the revelations um, from, of Me Too that statistically speaking, these there are millions, millions and millions of people committing these acts of petty violence every day. And if we turn to carceral solutions, and if we turn to like, public flagellation as our one and only um, solution, that's, that just has absolutely absolutely no hope of scaling. And so challenging these power dynamics demands like very, very concrete solutions, not just, um, for instance, uh, opening more domestic abuse refuge centers and things like securing rights at work, uh, tackling border policing, dec decriminalizing sex work, and moreover, wrenching the debate about protecting women uh, away from the hands of the far right who like don't really like give a fuck about it, honestly, at the end of the day. Um, and this is why I like I genuinely believe like, you know, better workers' rights and things like universal basic income and like universal basic services will do an enormous amount to like rectify those power imbalances and allow women to challenge cultures of, in which violence flourishes. So like I want survivorship to be like a political category um, because one of the great insights of feminist theory is the idea that the person was political and of course that's totally right, but uh, it's we can't let the uh, political collapse into the personal. Uh, we need to make survivorship about um, a political category emanating from the observation that uh, collective trauma is part and parcel of the way people experience gender and that um, encapsulates you know billions of people on the planet you know cis women trans women white women women of color every single woman um, experiences these systems and violence and like navigates them every day we also need to recognize the feedback loop between exclusion from formal and economic power and sexual violence. So not only does sexual violence flourish in hierarchy, sexual violence is actually a way of maintaining those hierarchies. Rape culture acts as like a system of domination by which women are systematically excluded from public spaces and from institutional power because they're just threatened with violence when they, when they dare to take a little bit of power and a little bit of like public oxygen. Like just think of the women that's just think of the language that's used against women like when they get a little bit uppity or like when they dare to enter parliament or to like have an opinion on the internet um <laughs> as i'm sure like everyone in this panel can testify um and it's kind of almost most visible when we think of how it's used um in like 
you know, largely male spaces, uh, like in the army and in, and in sort of uh, boys only public schools, like rape is used to practice and reinforce sexual hierarchies, like as an act of domination, all the boys assault uh, younger boys, people of higher ranks assault people of lower ranks. Like, so our dominant social institutions are like populated by people trained on the idea that sex is a way to test your own power and the limits of that on other people's bodies. So like in a way, sexual violence is very much a tool used to regulate women's participation in public space and in work and in domestic life. So to my eyes, sexual violence is not only like, you know, a, a pandemic problem, it's also like a technology of work because it very much um, ensures, maintains systems which keep women out of, uh, out of more powerful positions. And actually, in 2016, this was made like central to the um, Neonomenos Argentinian women's movement when like half a million women went on strike uh, precisely against the, um, the pandemic levels of femicide and sexual violence uh, in Argentina. And uh, like according, like in, according to this, like uniting these sort of different women's struggles was the idea that womanhood is essentially like a categorically unsafe working condition. And those are conditions that they just like decided to refuse to accept. And you know, a lot of people like hand wringing about how this means like, oh, we can, you know, we can never have sex again. And all these like feminazis are uh, purposefully misinterpreting like clumsy come ons as, you know, like, attempted assault, which is obviously like massively disingenuous, but I also think that it's worth dwelling on the fact here that it's, this movement is kind of ultimately about creating the conditions of, of good sex. Um, and by that, I mean like allowing people to embrace their sexuality in a situation where that doesn't mean encountering a system of that's like, freighted and, and menaced with uh, the legacy of just like thousands and thousands of years of systemic sexual violence. Um, so yeah, I, I want to decouple sex from a system of violence, like, I mean, unless you're into that, you know. <laughs> I, I don't know how to follow that. Can I just say, I'm actually really pleased that it snowed because I feel like the people that are here are like really actually want to be here. And we've, we, we've rooted out some, some people whose hearts just weren't completely in it, to be honest. Um, so thank you. And can I also just say how refreshing it is to actually be talking about, uh, you know, some real shit? Because you'd be forgiven for thinking, wouldn't you, uh, that the most pressing issue affecting women in Britain in, in uh, 2018 is telling trans women that they're not real women. Um, so um, it's, it's really... <laughs> How, literally, how nuts is that? How much time we devote to speaking about that? And it's it's really good to be talking about this um, because we know that, uh, you know, for me personally, it's good to be talking about this because we know that trans women, you know, also suffer disproportionately from, from sexual harassment. Um, but I've, I've found this really upsetting and, and difficult to talk about, actually, um, particularly when the Harvey Weinstein thing broke and all of these horrible stories were coming out like I just couldn't look on social media I don't know how it affected every, everybody else but you know I have experienced you know as, as, as I think uh, clearly it's emerging now most women have done um, you know uh, all, all different sorts of kind of you know ranging from uh, you know just comments to you know real sexual violence and um, yeah just finding it really difficult and I, and I can kind of understand why it has been swept under the carpet for so long because there's a part of me that's just like I don't want to think about it. I just I d don't want to think about it it's it's very upsetting please put it over there and can we just pretend it's not happening um but it has been happening we all know it's been happening and we're having a conversation about it now and I think that that's Fantastic, and I, I do draw parallels. Uh, it might seem like a weird kind of comparison to make, but between this and the, the, the trans thing, really, because I kind of feel like it's, it's like a new thing, like, oh, the Me Too movement, oh, like, we're having this conversation now, but it's like, this has been happening for hundreds of years, and you'd kind of think, like, oh, God, where have all these trans people come from? And it's like, 
no, people have always been there feeling like that, feeling shortchanged by the system and the way things are, but they just, you didn't hear about it, you know, and we weren't able to speak about it. People have always been just quietly been getting abused and feeling that they didn't have, you know, a voice. And, and now people are actually talking about what's really going on in the world, you know, and we are here and this is how we're being treated. And it's about time that we had a conversation about it. And, you know, a lot of thoughts have been running through my head because I do think a lot of this stuff is, is, is really complicated, actually. And going back and kind of reassessing situations that I've been in, in light of hearing other people and thinking, God, yeah, that was harassment, basically. You know, I, I used to go and meet guys um, for sex in toilets when I was 14. Uh, very classy, right? Um, and, you know, I was a pretty vulnerable LGBT kid at that time. And, you know, I always knew it was wrong, but now I look at that, and even though I was, you know, consenting on, on, on a certain level by putting myself in that situation, I mean, what is that but abuse? Um, and so kind of going back and, and looking at things and, and kind of reframing them in my mind and, you know, a lot of stuff, you know, just thinking like, are we getting a bit carried away with or is it all going a little bit too far? And I'm just thinking, well, no, this, this stuff was wrong five years ago. It was wrong 10 years ago. It was wrong 20 years ago. It was wrong 50 years ago. And we know this because the people that would, you know, that, that have done these things, you know, done these things to me and, and to other people, if, if, if somebody did that to someone in their family, to a woman in their family, they would go mental. So it's always been wrong. It, it, we're not just saying that it's wrong now. It has always been wrong. And the people that are doing it knew that it was wrong deep down on some level because we know there's a right and a wrong way to treat people. And, and we feel it, you know, viscerally. It's... It's, it's not right to sexually harass people, ultimately. So I think it's great we're having this conversation, and I think that we, it does need to go somewhere, obviously. But I just keep thinking, you know, when is it going to stop? Because we are having a conversation about gender. We're having a conversation about the way men and women treat each other and what we're happy with, what we're not happy with, what we want to change. And I keep thinking, oh, it's all just going to blow out. We're all, everyone's going to stop talking about it now, like the MPs' expenses, and then everyone gets upset about it. And actually, more stuff comes through, and you see people like Harvey Weinstein getting, you know, dragged down and... Um, Who's the other one? Kevin Spacey. And I agree, it's about more than, you know, public scalpings of people. But actually, you look at that and you think, no, there is some momentum to this. So where is it going to go next? And I know that this sounds really corny, but I do believe that it comes down to education. Because, you know, at the end of the day, we, we have urges as human beings, you know. And 500 years ago, society was much more violent. You know, you're much more likely to be murdered in this country, uh, at, at least. So things can change. People can learn to control their natural urges. Um, you know, I'm not necessarily, necessarily saying that raping somebody is a natural urge, but you know, it, we all of us have to go through a process of learning to be civilized and control. You know, we don't. You know, if, if we could all act with with impunity, there, there are people that I probably would have gone strangled by now. You know, so, so I believe that it is possible to teach people to be better versions of themselves. And, and I have to believe that, and history shows us that that is true. So we need to talk about boys. The focus needs to be on boys because, you know, yeah, not all men, but obviously a significant fucking proportion, right? <laughs> and, it, and, it, and this is the thing that we haven't really talked. When I think about the kind of abuse that I've experienced, as an LGBT kid, as a, as a, as a young gay boy, as a transgender, escort as a young woman you know all of the different permutations of it the one thing that it had in common for maybe like one instance was it was men and male entitlement and people feeling that they could do certain things to me not because I was a, a, a queer kid not because I was a woman not because I was a trans person or whatever they were reading me as but because they they were men essentially and I I do believe that it's not to bash all men because there are lots of perfectly well-behaved men but also teaching apparently um <laughs> there are lots of there are lots of no seriously no offense to that there are there are they're like unicorns I really want to believe that they exist um <laughs> I've met a lot of bad men in my time please don't, don't judge me um but um girls as well like my friend's a teacher and she's saying you know that the things that that the boys in school say to the girls and they don't even know that it's like you can say no actually that's out of order you know don't send me a picture of your dick or 
or, or whatever it may be or you know speak speak to me in that way so we've we've got it like even just something as simple as you know consent through the metaphor of do you want a cup of tea you know like why aren't we taught that in schools well i clearly we have a problem you know, and it, and it just really surprised me for that. Oh, you know, it's Hollywood, and oh, we've got it in politics, and we've got, got it, in, and it's like, no, it's everywhere, and we, and and, I've, and we all kind of knew it on some level, but we've we've had that confirmed and validated now that that other people have experienced this. So we've got a problem. We've got to do something about it. For me, it absolutely comes down to education and just teaching people to behave themselves a bit better, so that we can all get on. <laughs> Cheers. Hello. What a lovely crowd. You guys aren't saying hello back to me. What's up? I know it's snowing outside, or it's not snowing here. Boys will be boys. Hello. Look at that. So you hear that, you hear that saying, right? Boys will be boys. And locker room talk. And um, you all remember Trump with his panani, well, he didn't use the word panani, but grabbed them by the. And one of the things that struck me when I heard that from a potential presidential, well, from a presidential candidate was that, you know what, the problem lies in what has been acceptable practice within our society. I mean, a lot of what we've heard now on stage is absolutely bang on. But in reality, there's so much that we've allowed to, you know, kind of like go by without anybody challenging it. How many times has someone said something to you that instinctively you don't like, but then you laugh it off, or you have a smile on your face and you just want to crawl out there rather than take the opportunity to say, you know what, forget you, don't you speak to me like that. Sometimes these things take time. What the movement, I think, has done so successfully is to peel away the veil of obscurity, the veil, the protection that it has given the, oppre you know, the oppressors. More importantly, it's made all these institutions that have protected or hidden the fact, it's made them, like, put them out there stark naked. You hear too much now. I mean, look, everything is coming out. Every, you know, what's that saying about the truth comes out? You can never keep it hidden, right? I mean, you hear all these things like Oxfam and Save the Children, all these institutions, Parliament, all of the things that have been going on for decades, if not centuries, that we're just hearing about now. And why is that? Because finally, somebody gives a rat's ass. Finally, society is demanding accountability. We never used to do that before. Or everything used to be swept under the carpet before. Right? When something happened, how did we deal with it? How did people deal with it? It was more like, you know, be quiet, don't say anything, or you buy them off. And now that's no longer acceptable. I think there's individual responsibility as well as collective responsibility. So I'm looking at this from the perspective of an activist, right? We've all experienced something along the way. Some of us far more serious than others, right? But what are you going to do about it? That's my question. What's the solution? It starts with you. It starts with me. It actually starts with us. So. There are those who have experienced it who felt powerless and probably in fear or out of shame, said nothing, or perhaps they did say something and nobody listened to them. But what about those of us that witnessed what was happening and did nothing about it? We are all, or they are all culpable. I think it's all well and good to point fingers and go, you know, uh, because we all recognize the societies we live in. The, what you find here in the UK, you find it in the US, you, you will find it in India, you'll find it in Nigeria, you'll find it in a lot of countries. Where, while there might be cultural distinctions, right, but it, there is that men entitlement, right, about the place of a woman and who she is. 
But fortunately for us, a hundred years on, because of the struggles and the fights those before us have done, those who have fought so hard for our freedom and liberty at the cost of theirs, because of all the sacrifices made, it is so much more important now that in whichever capacity you're in, you recognize that you have a duty of care, not just to yourself, but also to those around you. To call something out when it's wrong, to stand up and be a shield of protection for somebody else. Now, we don't all have to be, I don't know, Martin Luther King, Emily Pankhurst. No, you could be Rosa Parks. Just don't get up. Start a civil movement that way, right? The reality is, a solution has to start from society. It has to start from the people. Once the people have made a decision about what is acceptable practice, then it will be coded in law. It is not enough. I mean, we can't possibly expect our, I mean, as much as we have standard of care for our public officials, right? But you have to remember those public officials are just like you and I. They've come from a society where certain things are acceptable. So to the extent you want people in public office or you want your managers or people of privilege to behave better, it actually starts from everybody starting you know, pretty much at ground zero and say we all have to behave the same. Because you will find, I recall, I was doing this drive from Ghana to Lagos in Nigeria. Oh, I, was, I didn't realize how, um, you know, education gives you a sense of privilege, right? I didn't realize how privileged I was because my, my attitude and my thinking was very well, no, that's not right. Um, yes, you asked for my papers, I've given them to you. Um, you know, I questioned every official. <laughs> well, it was an eye-opener for me, people. It was an eye-opener for me because I realized that the customs official standing between the border, you know, standing at the border between two countries was far more powerful than me. Even with all the education I had, it didn't matter how much I screamed about what is right and what is wrong, at that moment in time, he was the boss. I saw women who were carrying, um, you know, their goods, trading goods, and they were pretty much begging so that they could cross because either they didn't have a piece of paper. I mean, this all affects the, uh, the economic, so to speak. And this guy was there with some people kneeling down in front of him, some people standing up, and he was making decisions and people palming him with money. And I was disgusted because it was wrong. Absolutely wrong. It, that's wrong. That's corruption. How dare they? Blah, blah, blah. Oh, my God. Then I was about to cross the, um, I mean, you see the relevance here. I was about to cross, my car gets stopped, and I was asked for ECOWAS papers which the driver had, and they kept asking for something else. And I was like, I need to see the boss. I mean, this is just not right, right? And the boss comes and says, what's the problem? And the driver shows the ECOWAS papers. You know what the boss does? He takes the ECOWAS papers and says, well, you can't go until you give me something. <coughs> oh, oh, Lord. I totally, I was livid. I was, I said, I demand. I, oh, my God. I totally went crazy on him. My husband, who was with me, who is much more in sync with how these things work, said, Shola, in the name of God, please, don't worry, just, just wait. Let me go and deal with this. We went to have a conversation. I said, no, we will not move. We are not paying anybody any money. But here I was looking at my country, Nigeria in front of me, and I was stuck at the border, border of Benin Republic. Think about that for a second. I was probably there for a few hours. My husband went, listen, if these people decide to go crazy, and shoot you right now. The only thing people will hear are stories. But that experience told me something. So my husband paid them something. We finally went. It was a different shola on the way back to Ghana. I was very, oh, how can I help you, sir? Oh, yes, not a problem. Here's my passport. Your because now I understood the game. But the reality is, those who have experienced any form of abuse or harassment, have go, they go through the same thing, where you become conditioned it doesn't matter what you know. In that moment in time, you feel powerless. You feel fearless. Not fearless, but you feel powerless. And if there were not more people 
Imagine there were more people like me at that point in time when I was shouting about this is wrong. But those people, at, at the very minimum, those custom officials will be coward, right? That's what the Me Too movement has done. It has said, enough is enough. I could not care less what this is going to cost me, and a lot of activists that are behind this, and those who, who are ready to own their stories and share their experiences, it pretty much boils down to, you know, I've got power, and I'm going to use my voice. I'm going to use whatever I have to be able to say that this has to change. And from the perspective of what is going to, what's going to be the next step, where do we go to from, next, from here? And how can we ensure that this doesn't die down? This doesn't become another flash in the pan. Oh my God, do you remember the era of Me Too movement? Do you remember the era of the Time's Up movement? Oh yeah, yeah, I was there. Did you hear all that? What time is it? Time's Up. You know, oh, that was really good music, right? We, were, we have to take it from there. Or else what's going to happen is that those, the cynics and the skeptics, will go, mm, well, we knew it wasn't going to matter, it wasn't going to matter much. And that starts actually from our generation. I was saying when I came in that all of you make me feel really young. Just look at you. You all look so young, it's wonderful. And it starts from your generation. What are we going to do about it? And what we're going to do about it is start by using our feet, by using our mouths, by using our hands. Use your right to vote to bring about change. Thank you. Thank you so much, though. That was incredible. Um, I'm now going to throw it over to you guys if anyone has any questions. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to take them like two or three at a time and then pass it over to the panel and then come back. That's all. Ask right. us anything. <laughs> We've got no shame in this panel. No shame. Yeah. <laughs> Why is my mic being taken away from me? <laughs> <laughs> well, any questions? Okay, so we've got one over here. Um, so I'm, um, so Eleanor, you were talking about, um, you know, that legislation has to come about um, sort of as a following to the Me Too movement or some sort of more material thing. It can't be just a public scorn. And you said, for example, more uh, funding for domestic uh, violence refuges and shelters. I'm actually doing a project at uni right now, and we're looking at how um, funding for uh, domestic uh, refuge is being completely slashed. Basically, it's being, it's losing the ring fence. It's not being ring fenced anymore. It's going to be part of a bigger thing, and depending on local authorities, on probably men on the, you know, making the decisions, they're the ones who allocate the funds if they want or not, or give it to older er elderly people, which fine, but you know, we're not going to see an increase in domestic shelters, basically. So I'm just writing this piece, and we're a group of four, and we're very idealistic. We hope, you know, it'll get out of, you know, not only our grades, our teacher is going to see it, but just hopefully we'll be able to pitch it elsewhere. But what, what, what you, you, you were saying, Shola, we should get out and vote, but like, what do we do in this case? Like, I don't, I just don't know what do we do? What can really happen with domestic shelters? I do think we need them, but you know, my project, yeah, fine, but I don't know. That's sort of my question. Thank you for that question. Oh, two more. Oh, okay. <laughs> yeah. Hi, um, I just wanted to say that sometimes it really helps to look at it through the same problem through a different lens. So I would ask, for example, I would ask myself, if the world were a place where, I don't know, 99% of uh, you know, serial killers were women and one in six children had been abused you know, by the time they become a teenager by a woman and 99% you know, um, of sexual violence was committed by women, how would the world be dealing with that today? And I think we need to ask that question to find our answers. And then is there one more or...? Okay, so how about, yeah, we'll move, we'll, we'll, we'll start, those are two quite big questions. So we've got, what do we do about the closure of domestic shelters? And we've got, 
what if the roles were reversed? Yeah. Excellent. Now, the closure of the domestic um, violence centers, the first thing you've done is you've identified the problem. And in identifying the problem, you've also found that you are passionate about the fact that it's going to close, right? And you don't think it's right because you're like, well, if that closes, then how does that impact all these women? And what, what exactly kind of safe haven are we creating for them? What's the alternative, right? So I would say to you, given the point that I made about voting, I would say to you that for your local, for your MP, for instance, find out what his views are or her views are on that issue. Sorry, I'm already awake. <laughs> <laughs> It's a really distressing noise to wake up to. <laughs> I, really, I, I really hate ducks now, so... <laughs> Sorry, continue, uh, Shay. So I would say find out from your uh, member of parliament, from the government, while they are going through the process of voting, demand, raise questions just like this. In fact, do more than raise questions. I always say it's all well and good identifying the issue that everybody already knows. Come up with a solution and then challenge them on it. The MP that gives you the right answer, or at least the, the, the most persuasive and most reasonable answer, that's the person you should vote for. And then you make sure you call them up on it. If you vote for them and they get in, make sure that MP is well aware that he's got a constituent that is watching him. But that is how it starts. The only way we can help drive things. So, so from a place of um, power, through your MP, and maybe your corporations, the corporations you work with, or maybe the, the piece of work that you're going to do for, for your school. Perhaps you could write an article that is published somewhere, um, well, somewhere that will make it even, you know, am amplify the issue and demand a call for action for change on it. But you can use your skill set to actually continue to drive that conversation. And if nobody's listening, you keep knocking on the door. If they're not listening, you start to hammer the door down. If they're not listening, you kick that door down until they pay attention, right? And I was just quickly going to say about the lady, um, the question at the back. Now that is some serious statistics, right? Because that's what we have right now with men, correct? No one talks about that. No one talks about it. of everything that's happening, and I'm talking mass shootings in high schools. Yeah, yeah, I'm yeah. I'm talking everything across the board. Wars is men. Right. Why are we not putting it on their table? The thing is, I mean, if you think about it just for a second, though, if we lived in, a, in an alternate universe where women were the, I don't know, sexual harassers and, the, you know, the murderers and all of that, it would actually mean women were the ones in power. Yeah. And men would be the ones, I don't know, having the men's march and they'll be the ones still marching. They'll be the ones demanding rights for votes, right? And we'll probably get back to this. Somebody just like you will be asking the same question. So why not we just start by, you know, levels, you know, let's just level set and say, the most important thing here is, as Paris pointed out before, and being a woman of faith, you know, love your neighbor as you love yourself. Treat the next person as you want to be treated. It, it really basic human decency. Know what you guys think? I mean, I, obviously, I think the the questions are connected because I've got every sympathy um, if you're trying to secure funding, and I do think it's really important that shelters, uh, you know, have the money. And obviously, women's services are being disproportionately affected by the cuts. But it just it's so frustrating to me because it just feels like firefighting this stuff. And really, I guess what this this movement that we're discussing. Is, is about the, the wider issues of why women need to go to refuges, which, which is, you know, what, what you're saying, like, what, why are those women in that refuge? And really, we, we need to be having a conversation about how do we stop men raping people and hurting women, you know? And it's, it's, I, it's so difficult because I don't want to sound like I'm bashing. And I've constantly in my head, I'm like, not all men kind of thing, because I know that there are nice men. Of course I do. Um, but, I mean... And I don't want to kind of, you know, sit here and sound like a victim. But, I mean, I have been treated like shit by men my entire life. Like, it's just a fact. Like, it's, it, that is my experience. Um, and 
And we, 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 we do need to put the focus on, on to men. I agree. I, I really do agree. Um, I don't really know what more to say, <laughs> to be honest. Like, can men just fucking behave themselves, you know? But if we flip it, sorry. If we, fl if we flip it, though, there are a number of women who are more and more getting empowered, right? For the longest time, we've been waiting for men to behave themselves, and they've not done so. So it's time for us to rise up and take charge. Be it individually in your home, at your workplace, on the high street, anywhere. We need, I think there has to be that, you know this thing with, with us women, because and not all women are this way, so I, I'm not trying to generalize, but there's that thing culturally where women, almost people say, oh, by nature, are quieter and they're calmer and, you know, they're more conservative. Clearly, they haven't met me. But it's so important that given what we are seeing and what we're hearing, that's one of the powerful things about the Me Too movement. It's showing to many women and men, you're not alone. Because sometimes as a victim, you think you're the only one going through this. So you don't want to talk about it or you feel ashamed about it. But I think if we flip it, I mean, if the boys don't want to take it, then we need to just, we need to take hold of the reins. You need to take the hold of the reins of your life and call things out. Yeah, um, yeah, I kind of agree with the sort of uh, like frustration of uh, like the second uh, questioner and the responses on the panel because it's just, uh, perennially these things get categorized as like women's issues, which means that like this is being done to you and now you're expected to fix it, which is always fun. And I feel like I, you know, I just have things that I would rather be doing. Like, you know, maybe I want a lion at some point in the next decade, maybe. But um, about the um, like deeper point here about interrogating what masculinity is, and um, and like how it functions as like a system that like legitimates violence, and because you know, as Shola pointed out at the beginning in her beginning remarks, um, there is this kind of natural naturalization, this impulse towards categorizing like like people who are born with like a certain configuration of like genitals or chromosomes, or whatever, are just like n have this like natural teleology towards violence, which is just, I mean profoundly, profoundly untrue, and I think profoundly insulting to men, because what it says is that, like, yes, sure thing, you're in charge of, like, the vast majority of, like, the economy and politics and that kind of thing, but nonetheless, you can't be trusted to, like, engage some kind of critical faculties and some kind of empathy, right? There's this incredible contradiction um, at the heart of, like, the ideology by which we justify continued male power. And I also think we need to... Um, think about it um, genuinely as uh, something which damages boys and men as well, because um, like these, uh, that profound lack of empathy, uh, that profound like alienation from what is like a deeply human impulse towards like caring for, for one another um, is, you know, part of the reason that like boys do violence uh, to themselves and to one another as well as to women. It's like a, a like a profoundly like traumatic thing like being socialized as a man I kind of feel sorry for people when I hear like a lot of men like genuinely I think um, expressing confusion um, in the wake of Me Too and all that um, saying like but I thought like I thought that was fine I thought that was just like I thought that was just flirting I thought that was just what sex was like being completely completely unequipped with the ability to like think about, um, you know, think about say like flirting as like building empathy rather than asserting dominance, thinking about their relationships with people, not about like competition, but about like cooperation, like that like makes me sad for them, which I know, I mean, you know, at the times I don't, you know, like occasionally like want to strangle them, right? Um, but it also brings me back to, um, <laughs> Uh, something you said earlier, Paris, about like, you know, we know it's wrong, we know assault is wrong. And I think like, yeah, like, 
sure when we know when we call it sexual assault like there are very few people who would say like sexual assault is fine right because that's been like you know thoroughly discredited but like that wasn't always the case like the the idea of like sexual assault is actually quite a, a new terminology uh, that's allowed like women to articulate their experiences and i think because of this like you know a uh, profoundly traumatic process of male socialization a lot of men genuinely don't know it's wrong right um I think a lot of this is about, you know, there's, it's, it's, a, it's hazy, right? Because I think a lot of it is, you know, not wanting to examine your own behaviors because you might find something there that you don't like, right? So that we put all of our problems onto these like few bogeymen, like, oh, it's just Harvey Weinstein, oh, it's just um, like the people in parliament, which means that you don't actually have to examine your own actions and the actions of your mates, which is uh, pretty convenient. But there is an extent to which, like, as you say, this is where education comes in, there is an extent to which um, uh, people don't know how to um, identify and how to root out, like, toxic behaviours in their own lives. And that goes for women as well, because, you know, a lot of, a lot of women just, like, have to go on, like, a feeling of just kind of, like, that a lot of um, people just call like the ick, like just the feeling of this like unreconstructed discomfort with a certain situation. Because we don't talk about this, we don't have the language to express that like actually that feeling of like, oh, I don't know about this, is pointing to like a profound system of global violence and that's a problem and we should do something about this. So I'm not sure that we do all know what it's wrong. I think we're kind of still trying to figure it out, which is what like the Me Too movement is, like is is wonderful for like this kind of public discussion on like the parameters of like sex and power. Um, on the um, domestic refuges question, um, like I get your frustration, right? We've been through um, oh Christ, eight, seven, eight years of austerity, and it wasn't really great before that. Um, but I think it's worth dwelling on the fact that uh, we didn't always have domestic refuges, right? Um, and we didn't always have things like uh, child support, which was also bound up with the same issue of like uh, empowering women in the home, giving them some economic independence from potentially uh, abusive husbands, etc. Um, these were all gains of a feminist movement who went, hang on a second, uh, we can just start organizing this. And they did. They, this wasn't think something that was given by the state. This was something that women started doing collectively, like off of their own backs, like with their own pooled resources and energies. And then, you know, that got institutionalized. And I think there are a lot of, um, there are a lot of good, good elements to that. But I think we kind of forget that these things didn't, these things weren't granted by the state and we don't have to wait for the state to do that. Of course, we should be absolutely, as Charlotte said, like demanding that our politicians fund it more. And um, because there is a, like a, it's, it's so simple, right? Just like, just give us more money. Like the infrastructure is kind of there already. Just fund it more. But um, I don't think we need to, we, we don't need to wait for like, you know, Corbyn to get in or whatever. We can, we can start doing that now. We can start like building those infrastructures of solidarity because we've already done it once. And those people are like still alive. The people who, who did those, uh, who started those initiatives. Uh, yeah. Yeah, um, yeah, I think that was that's really powerful, and also the idea that it's not just that men don't know; it's also that women actually don't know how to expect good and respectful behaviour from men as well. Um, but one thing that kind of came out of the discussion that I thought was really interesting, um, and it's something that, while obviously I'm like very supportive of the Me Too movement, something that has kind of troubled me a little bit, and you kind of touched on it in your talk, um, Eleanor, was this idea that sometimes we're still fixed in this idea of there has to be a perfect victim and a perfect perpetrator. And this idea that, you know, you're a perfect victim if you don't ask for it. And the women that don't ask for it are often, you know, wealthy white women. Whereas if you are a sex worker, for example, imagine, you know, how how difficult it is for any woman to be believed is even more difficult to be believed if you are a sex worker and you've experienced violence at work or outside of work or if you are queer if you are a woman of color if you are a woman who's you know undocumented and so is affected by policies like the hostile environment and i feel like that element hasn't really been included as much similarly in terms of 
the perfect perpetrator. You know, we have um, number 45, um, the President of the United States, who was elected on a platform of protecting the nation from Mexican rapists, but himself is an alleged rapist um, and has admitted to sexual assault. So I'm interested to hear what the panel thinks about kind of how can we move past those kind of perfect, like what are the limitations of those kind of parameters and how can we have this movement in a way that doesn't reinforce this see she didn't ask for it at all or you know some men are allowed are abusers and other men can do the same things but they're not abusers um well i think that it really cuts to the heart of kind of what i was saying before about not really wanting to talk about this because i think that when we start to examine this stuff um we have to examine the people in our lives and, and the people that, that that we love and it's it's easier isn't it if we can just think that it is just one or two bad eggs you know like one percent of the population are rapists and paedophiles or or whatever um and i and i see this also with um men who pay for sex as so on i don't necessarily think that that has to be abusive um I, th I think sex work should be legal, but it doesn't necessarily mean that I think that the guys that pay for sex are, are wonderful. But, um, you know, a lot of my female friends are really shocked, you know, by the stories that I would tell them. You know, guys guys would come and see me and, I'd, uh, you know, they'd be on the phone to their wives saying, um, yeah, just come and pick the, the kids up. I'm just seeing a man about a dog or something. Do you know what I mean? Um, and it's really upsetting to me because I like to think that the men in my life aren't complicit in this stuff, you know, but the, the fact of the matter is that, you know, it is, it's, 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 you know, people in this room, it'll be your, your dads, your uncles, your brothers, your best friend from school, you know, um, that the statistics tell us that that's, that's the case. And that's really difficult. And also I think in terms of, you know, having the perfect, victim um yeah i find that really problematic as well and actually and i understand where it comes from but um i personally really um hate the term survivor um as like and I, I get it but i just i find it quite patronizing and infantilizing is because you know i don't actually and i know that people do die from sexual violence but for me personally i don't feel that my life was really in danger at any point um so you know the, it, it isn't this kind of you know really extreme example of i always think about the the big bad wolf and little red riding hood you know going through the through the forest in reality it's not it's it's normal people it's it's the guy that you sit next to at work right and it's and it's 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 complicated all of this stuff and and i think that's why it's so difficult to talk about and so good that we are talking about it now because it's happening every day in in every every situation um and it's it's horrible it's, it's i don't i don't want to think about i don't want to think that that's what you know the men in my life are but i don't know how useful that is really I just wish men would behave themselves. I don't understand how we can expect to have any form of perfection in an imperfect world. You can't have a perfect victim when the experience they've been through is imperfect, when it is clear that there are no parameters, no limitations no protection there is no perfection we live in an imperfect world with imperfect people doing imperfect things that is the bottom line personally for me i think that the world has moved on from certain standards and certain ways of thinking only because the new the generation we're in now, we are kind of, you know, we're so much more, we're so much cooler about certain things, more, so much more chilled out about certain things, right? And we also call things out. We go, uh, you know, back in the day, perhaps, there would have been, um, oh, did she have a child out of wedlock? That kind of thing. And now when you hear a comment like that, I don't know, maybe from your mother, from your grandmother, probably, you go, okay, grandma, you need to chill, yes. Do you want a cuppa? Yeah. The world has moved on. 
what I will say is this. I think it starts from each one of us individually calling out the imperfections, calling out the, um, you know, being the devil's advocate. So if someone comes to you and says, oh, you know, did you hear Sarah went through this? But you know what, on campus, she was kind of like the national cake. Everybody had a piece of her. She may have been a national cake out of, her, out of consent, but that doesn't give anybody any right to have access to this national cake without her consent. But we know how people think. Even amongst us in this very room, you know that if you were aware of a Sarah, who didn't mind, you know, she was a party girl, and you hear something happens to her, you know the first thing you're going to think about subconsciously, even though you may not voice it out, is exactly what somebody else is voicing out. The only difference, the only difference, is you might not care about it. You might not think to yourself that that should matter, because you're going to hear about it. So I would say, dealing with issues like that, we should probably be more conscious about ensuring that, look, let us take a look at what has happened here. Let us give protection where protection should be given. I don't want to hear personally when uh, you know, people make comments, oh, but you know, whether it's about you know, someone being LGBT and some people have their, I don't know, old fashioned thinking about what's right, what's wrong, or perhaps, People call certain things out because they don't have the same views. I think it's really far more important that, again, like I mentioned earlier, treat people like you want to be treated. And if you are in a position of power or in a position to make decisions concerning things like this, or somebody comes to ask your opinion, set them straight. I think it starts with that, right? Um. Yeah, I, I, I totally agree with, with what's been said. And um, yeah, I guess sort of this language of perfection is a kind of perversely interesting because like perfect means um, if you're a perfect victim, that means that you were assaulted in such a way that it doesn't trouble my view of the world, right? Which is obviously very limited because like it's likely that your view of the world is shaped by ideologies that are designed to protect male impurity, impurity, impunity, male impurity, that was Freudian. <laughs> this is being recorded, hi mum. And um, obviously that precisely if you're feeling uncomfortable that like, mm, I'm not sure, I'm not sure this, you know, this victim was like quite assaulted in a way that I feel comfortable with, good. Good, you should feel uncomfortable because as, um, as has been pointed out, we're all um, continually having to unlearn all of this, um, like, you know, the ideology of rape culture that we've been marinating in since birth. And um, I'm really glad that um, the whole um, uh, Trump thing was, was brought up because I think it's a really sort of neat uh, encapsulation of a lot of the dynamics of how the, the um, conversation around uh, sexual violence and particularly combating sexual violence has really been territorialized in a lot of the mainstream media by um, the right and the far right, like the, the, the only time in which we contemplate that maybe sexual violence is something that we should do something about is when the Daily Mail um, it goes on like a fear mongering rampage about, um, about like Muslim rape gangs or whatever. Like it's- Trans women in women's toilets. Yeah, exactly, yeah, exactly. Everyone yeah, suddenly everyone cares. Suddenly like Rod Little is like really, really concerned about um, like protecting women as long as it hits like something, that, like a stick he can use to bash trans women. Like it's, it's so clear, like the profound disingenuity there, right? But um, this obviously shouldn't just be pointed out that like it's, um, <laughs> it's uh, not a way to uh, protect uh, any woman from sexual violence. Like, we should point out that, you know, it never was uh, about protecting women. What it's about is, is protecting, essentially, a property right of the, like, white men perceive they have over the bodies of all women, particularly, like, white women. And so, um, actually, no, I take that back, all women. <laughs> um, and I think this is, what is important in like uh, in unpacking Trump's statements about quote unquote Mexican rapists, like because it's not it's not actually in conflict with his um, 
statements about like you know grabbing women by the pussy um that's the same worldview right it's a, it's a worldview in which like he as a powerful white man has complete impunity to do whatever he likes uh, with women's bodies because they are objects their property with you know he can use and dispose of uh, uh, completely freely um but um that property relationship is is purely uh, is purely uh, one of one of white men right and so when like Mexicans are seen to be a, a threat to that property. It's you know it's not seen as like a violation of you know someone's of someone's rights. It's seen as like you know the equivalent of of theft or breaking a window. It's part of the same world picture. He's actually not contradicting himself for once. Um, and this like we need to uh, pay a lot of attention to um, how we we only talk about the uh, like sexual violence as it's experienced and framed by white women and particularly white citizens because you know, um, as Shola pointed out um, the like discussions about morality of um, like uh, sexual behavior uh, just completely collapse right before the like untrammeled power of border guards and of policemen they don't they don't have to care about um, about individual women, women's rights. Like, what in that power relationship makes them? Absolutely nothing. I think, yes, while it's important to um, educate uh, people about that, so, you know, to make sure that, you know, whilst we still have those structures, they're not totally populated by the worst, most venal people possible, um, it is something that we should um, examine to talk about um, how those power hierarchies in and of themselves foster those uh, those mentalities of total impunity, right? I think there is something inherent to the position of the border guard, inherent to the position of the cell guard, of the prison guard, of the policeman, that means that uh, people feel like they can behave however they want without consequences because, you know what, they're not idiots. They can at the moment. That's, that's factually um, the, a reality, right? Okay, so it's approaching nine o'clock, which unfortunately is the end of our discussion, which is really sad. Um, but could we have another round of applause for our panelists? Okay, so get a drink before you leave. Um, it's really cold out there, so maybe a whiskey or a bourbon or something. Um, and see you at the next IRL. Yeah. <laughs>